followed. My dad is turning green, like literally green. My last nav check put me at the Grange Point 4. This is Control, we are radio. Keep calm and remain on the guard frequency. Sits and sieves, captains and commanders, you're tuned to the guard frequency. And as all good pilots know, when you're out in the deep black, you want to keep one ear on the guard. This is episode 163 of the Best Damn Space Sim Podcast Ever, and was recorded on Friday, April 7th, made available for download Tuesday, April 11th, over at GuardFrequency.com. I'm Ostra. I'm Jeff. And I'm Ken Shadow. And in the audio booth, making sure we sound as smooth as the time we shaved Jace, oiled him up, and sent him headfirst down the Tobaga track, whilst listening to Barry White having the whole thing narrated by Morgan Freeman is Henry. So, what do we have in store this week, Ken Shadow? In this week's Squawk Box, it's a race for real-life space bucks. After that, we hit the flight deck and see what news from your space sims has landed as we cover the latest from around the verse, featuring mocap and everything Turbulent has been doing for Star Citizen. Price changes and gallant updates on the Thargoids in Elite Dangerous. And finally, we tune to the feedback loop and let quite a few of you join in on the conversation. The Guard Frequency crew is expanding again, and this time we're looking for correspondents to join our ranks of writers and research badgers. Is there a space sim out there that you're passionate about that you want to help us cover? If so, we'd love to hear from you. Drop us a message on Twitter, Facebook, or our website, or via email to squawk at guardfrequency.com. That takes care of the housekeeping, so let's get on with the show and see what's coming through the squawk box. Hey, you boys need a carrier around here? Uh, everything's under control. The situation's normal. Cryptor, 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 this is Jeff saying welcome to the Squawk Box, everyone. As I can tell you from experience, the space race and the race to the moon captured the attention of all amateur and professional space enthusiasts while it was happening. However, because of that attention, there was basically no limit to the budget. And boy, did it show. And the entire NASA Apollo program had a price tag of about $123 billion in today's money. But that's NASA. The modern Russian space program has an estimated price tag of $20.5 billion to keep them going until 2025. Google has decided to try encouraging more economical solutions to space travel. The Lunar X Prize competition has four major requirements. Land a spacecraft on the surface of the moon. Have the spacecraft or contained vehicle travel 500 meters on the moon's surface. Transmit high definition video and images back to Earth. And do all of this with at least 90% private funding. Now some of you are saying, so what? Just call up Elon and ask to borrow a rocket. But that's the catch. The grand prize for accomplishing this task first will be $20 million. Obviously that's a nice prize in terms of raw money, but anyone who knows about space travel will tell you that $20 million to send something to the moon requires serious penny pinching. Right now there seems to be five major teams in contention. One from India, Japan, Israel, the US, and a final team that is a conglomeration of 15 countries and four organizations. Our information says that several of the team's budgets already blew past the 20 million mark. India's team may have spent as much as 75 million. It'll be something to see whether the winner ends up with some spare change to spend or just ends up offsetting their losses. That's really all I can see happening. 20 million dollars doesn't seem like much. Well, I, I would agree, but I don't think that they should do this for the prize itself. I, I think $50 million would be more. I, I think they could pony up, uh, all these people in the space race currently could pony up and do $50 million. But still, I don't think it's the prize itself that's the catch here. I think that after the U.S. landing on the moon, landing on the moon as a private corporation, I think that's the prize. Well, sure, yeah, that's fantastic, but there's not much of a financial incentive and you're looking at needing investors to put money in without much coming back. I don't know. A lot of the teams are getting, like, they have other things that they're doing besides just sending something to the moon. Hopefully this is a byproduct of something bigger, right? Well, I don't know. I mean, it's a big project and it'd be awesome if it happens. It just seems like, it seems like we're barely scratching the surface with private companies getting us into orbit and hauling cargo and the occasional tourist 
It just seems like it's too early to look at the Lunar X Prize, especially with such a small payout. But nobody's touched on this yet, but here's the big thing. The moon is not owned by anybody, and the company that makes it is going to have a whole bunch of data on how to maybe commercialize on this on the moon. I mean, the minerals, uh, you know, whatever. I mean, there is investment opportunity. If I was, if I was an investor of this, uh, one of these things I'd be seeing, go for it. Just you know, fill my pocketbook afterwards because that's the real end goal. That's right, Jeff. The cheaper that they can get lifting mass to the moon, the more likely exploiting the moon for its resources is. The more robots they can get on the moon, the more likely you'll be able to mine it, the more likely you'll be able to get build things on the moon. That's exactly what I'm saying. Like They started with private industry trying to get cargo runs to the station, which we have now, and that's kind of getting to be more commonplace, but it's still you know, a big deal and a cool thing for them. But it's, you know, we're still in the infancy of that and we're not even exploiting that fully. You know what I mean? It just seems like this is too far of reach for private citizens. But then again, I might not be giving them enough credit. They don't necessarily have to be private citizens per se. They just have to make sure they're getting private funding. Oh, right. That's what I mean. The private sector in general, general, not a government. Yeah. We've been to the moon and there's all that how to get there is already a fact and it's and it's an engineering possibility we know we know we can get there what it's taken they've got all those missions they've done what do we do seven landings on the moon there's just all kinds of data there that they can use to 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 make this work now they're going to come up with new and interesting ways to get there and make it work so this is this is going to be a good thing for everyone read seen or heard something that you might find interesting to others listening on the spectrum send an email to squawk at guardfrequency.com. But for now, let's see what news has hit the flight deck. Three, one, seven, five, Port Bay, hands on approach, check your screen, call the ball. Don't get technical with me. All of our Star Citizen news this week comes from Around the Verse, which spent the week getting info from the Austin studio. Most of their recent work was focused on the launch of 2.6.2, but they've been chugging along ever since. They're making revisions to the Stanton system map and some tweaks to items and AI in landing zones. They're also working on adjustments to shops. Currently, if you are looking for some sweet new threads to go cruising around in, you have to go the Armani route and buy the whole top to bottom outfit. The devs are reworking the system so that you can purchase individual items to mix and match. Coordinated outfits will still be sold as a unit at a slightly discounted in-game price. So if you want to mix that bright gold shirt with the screaming fuchsia pants, there is something wrong with you, but the game will let you do it. Austin also spent some time getting transition animations done with male and female characters, and this time they didn't have to go visit Gollum. That's right, that in-house mocap studio that the backers funded way back in September of 2013 is getting a workout making sure that characters don't suddenly T-pose and then appear sitting eating their lunch in the cafeteria. These transitions will also help when NPCs are interacting with more generic usable objects in the game. Turbulent got its own feature this week as well. They recently released Spectrum version 0.32 with some performance enhancements and UI customization options. In 0.33, they're hoping to give users the option to choose how they view ongoing communications. They'll be able to see everything chronologically or to view nested threads similar to how Reddit works. People replying to a particular comment will have all their replies appear under that comment rather than farther down. All of these new toys do come with bad news for some, however. After more features are implemented, Turbulent will begin the process of archiving and shutting down the old forums. Our research badgers heard a rumor of a date, but they couldn't verify the source. While forums and subcategories will be making the jump, they will not be importing the old forum data. So if you have a raging debate going on in the depths of the subscriber den, better start wrapping it up or, you know, just restart it on Spectrum. Apart from Spectrum, the Delta Patcher is getting in-house use with some success, released still officially soon trademark also in the works are a redesign of the rsi website and an update to the ship stats page as we mentioned when the hurricane debuted apparently the data there is outdated and doesn't allow for accurate comparison between ships 
Both of these efforts are in their beginning phases, so no details or timelines has yet been established. Splitting that up so you don't have to buy the whole outfit, it's fantastic. I wish that was happening in Elite, but Star Citizen's going to really blow them away in the customization department. Well, also, Elite only has literal jumpsuits, right? Like full body ones? Yeah, and, and they're, you know, it's all full outfits. There aren't very many of them. Of course, we might see more when the update drops next week, but it's going to be nothing like Star Citizen has. Most games that allow the mix and match outfits thing are first person shooters as opposed to space sims, but that's only because most space sims don't have individual avatars doing anything. Right, or, 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 or just general MMOs too, right? Like wow and whatnot um i mean like in star trek online the outfits are some of my favorite things you know i love dressing up the characters but you have a whole lot of characters and a whole lot of officers in that game so the the dressing game is a lot more involved but in star citizen it's still going to be good yeah i I think you know up until this uh, point where our space sims have been involved uh, like if you think about wing commander and and free space and and all those others they're they're you know uh, you're always in first person going on to the next mission when you were landed on the ship and you fl- and, and you were a pilot in first person. You know, games like Eve didn't even start out having avatars of any kind. Or ex- they had a little portrait, but they didn't have any, you know, get out of your ship kind of thing. You were kind of like this clone body in this egg-shaped thing that was, you know, potted from ship to ship. But, uh, you know, and later in Eve, they, they kind of wrote that up and, and made those changes because that's what people really wanted to do. And, and I feel that way about Elite. I mean, you're really just first personing from your spaceship with very little else to do. So Yeah, for now, I really hope that expands. Something's got to get us through until more of Star Citizen comes out. So Elite's pretty much what we have. So one of the things they didn't mention here in the copy was um, during around the verse they showed off a couple of interesting other things. Specifically, the they gave a much better look at the um, new Drake Cutlass. I don't know if you guys any of you guys own a Cutlass, but um, it looks like I, a, I have a Cutlass Red. Well, the, the, did you see the new one? It looks nope. like a total uh, beast. Really? It's much. Yeah, they do a side by side shot, and it looks at least like two or three times the size of the old Cutlass. The, the new cockpit is much higher, and they have this, the seats work totally differently now. Or they're not as annoying with that weird slide back and forth thing. They kind of go up and down instead. Well, I know what I'm going to be watching, but I, I still want my strobes, man. I, I want my bling on my, on, on my emergency vehicle. You know, until, that, until I get that on my cutlass, I'm not going to be satisfied. The other thing they showed off was uh, some tool sets they were using for building on-surface stations, like research stations or, or outposts or things or something like that. Um, they have uh, some new technology where they've they've kind of showed some of it off before, but they did a lot more this this time on around the verse where they showed them plugging them together, and then uh, it made it unclear what exactly all of that was going to do at the end. Obviously, they're making these space stations, and it's a dev-only tool. But exactly how these work into the game, whether they're just like quest hubs or whether players can eventually control these in some fashion or whether uh, these are random spawns, uh, they didn't really clarify. But they did They did show off the tool and show that some of the really neat buildings they can make on planet surfaces with the tool. I have a question, actually, about the forums change. Go right ahead. With the forums, they're they're shutting down the old stuff and moving to the new system. Is the old stuff going to be available to browse through and read still, or is that going to be gone completely? It's going to turn into static pages. Yeah, it's going to be archived. Oh, okay, cool. So they're not getting rid of it. It's just not going to be in the new system. That makes sense. Yeah, you can still go read all of my horrible Star Citizen poetry and my <laughs> weird fan fiction and uh, see my uh, weird uh, game write-ups, but you can't add negative comments on them anymore. Well, that's great news. Definitely something that needs to be preserved for posterity. (laughs) Our Star Citizen community question this week is, are you using the new Spectrum site? Is the shutdown of the old forums going to cause you separation anxiety? We here at Guard Frequency are willing to listen to you and your concerns. Let us know what they are. Details coming up after feedback. Several interesting tidbits this week as Elite Dangerous stands on the cusp of the 2.3 update, due out this week as of the show's release. 
Highest profile are the deep cost cuts to cosmetic purchases in the Frontier store. Most paint jobs are now one pound or $1.75 US. Packs and bobbleheads are three, p- you know what, Lennon's not here, four dollars, and ship kits are mostly twelve dollars, though some individual items in all of these categories may vary. This is a permanent change and reflects the pricing of future items like ship name plates and commander outfits. Probably a smart move is the number of different types of items expands, especially given past player criticism of the arguably high prices for some of the options, many of which are relatively simplistic plain color changes with no design otherwise, for example. Frontier was also in the news in the wider world this week as the British Academy of Film and Television Arts, BAFTA, awards were held on Thursday the 6th. Their other game, Planet Coaster, was nominated in in the British game category, and Elite was nominated in the evolving game category. While neither won their category, losing out to games Overcooked and Rocket League, respectively, Having both of their current projects nominated is quite a feather in the cap for FDEV. It's worth mentioning that No Man's Sky was among the other nominees for the British Game Award, along with Planet Coaster. <laughs> You're kidding me. Making the awards pointless. <laughs> I, th- I think it's more a matter of a very narrow field of available nominees. <laughs> With speculation about the next stage of Alien storyline at a fevered pitch since the release of the unknown teaser at PAX East, today Galactic News reported a statement from the so-called Alien Czar. Federal Navy Admiral and Chief of Federation Security Aidan Tanner While the major governments have mostly stayed quiet through the events of recent months, Tanner confirmed the activity of the unknown craft some of us have encountered, either active or wrecked. Though he denied that they have any interest in or correlation with the unknown artifacts, and stated that there was no evidence thus far that the vessels had attacked any human ships. Otherwise, he answered no media questions, simply saying, When we know more, you'll know more. Almost time for the alien invasion, I think. Very soon. About damn time. Yeah, it's only been a couple of years. Really slow lead up. So, when he said the change reflects the pricing of future items like ship nameplates and commander outfits, I didn't quite get what he meant there. From what I understand, all the customization options, whether they're for a player or a ship, are going to fall into the same like pricing category. Because it's like a paint job or a suit should be similar and they, these are much more reasonable prices i mean they weren't i don't think bad before considering you weren't buying weapons you're buying customization options so paying money to support the game and buying a paint job makes sense this is much more reasonable though it's much cheaper i grabbed like three paint jobs today when the price dropped still kind of a bummer you have to pay for your name plates though that is kind of silly yeah but it's better than them selling the weapon you need to use to win the game you know what i mean it's better that it's a customization option that's in the store yeah although there there is an argument to be made for given how popular the nameplates are or are expected to be maybe like it would make sense to get a free one for every ship that you own or if you buy a ship you get a nameplate included and then additional nameplates you'd have to purchase separately. I don't know if that would make a lot of sense in the long run. I mean, to us as the players, sure, but to the company who's trying to live on microtransactions, probably not. I don't know, you know, what their financials look like, but I know that would probably cripple how many they would sell just because they're offering such a broad option. Like, when you buy a nameplate, I think you get nine versions of that same nameplate that you can use on any ship. And they're cheap, so it makes sense that you have to buy them, I guess. It's just kind of a bummer. I would like to see them in the game and then be able to buy fancy ones, but it is what it is. They need to make money. I'm going to venture to guess, and th- and I have no basis on this, but I'm, I'm going to guess that Frontier doesn't actually make a lot of money currently off of their own in-game store. I don't know how many ship skins you guys have bought, but I know, I mean, I haven't really played the game all that much, but I, I've never been tempted. And I haven't seen a lot of ships that are, you know, when I do open play... Uh, has seen a lot of ships with with custom skins on them. I, I only I only bought in the purple color. I bought colored lasers. I've got green lasers. I've got three paint jobs I use for my ASP. One of them came from the tactical pack, which has like six in it, and then the other two I think were just individuals. And then I've got custom paint job for my sidewinder that I got from an event. 
and I have a couple other paid options for some of my other ships. I, I buy things in the cash store, though, because I feel like I'm helping support the game. You know, and I think that's important, and, and that's the reason why we, you know, contribute to Star Citizen and why we back projects on Kickstarter. It's the same thing for me to buy something from the cash store uh, once in a while. Right, but there's there's kind of a perceived value there for most people, and I think that the, the prices they had were a bit high for perceived value. Yeah, a, a bit high, I would say. But th- like I said, this is better. Yeah, and I've looked at other things before thinking, ah, oh, do I want it? No, not for that price. I, I can wait, you know, kind of thing. But now I'll probably go back and take a look and go, oh, I can fill my bucket up for, you know, uh, for what I was going to spend on one or two items. So so what were the skins before were like $5 or were they $3? I can't remember. Yeah, they were. I think they were like 5 or something. It's come down now, so. Right. But I mean, I guess my point was, like a lot of the times you're, you're in a ship and you're like, you know, I'm going to get out of this cobra mark whatever pretty soon i'm gonna get onto something else i really want to spend money on a on a skin for it you know and then you get in the next ship and you're, you're it's the same debate right now if it's a buck you know who cares oh you're right you're right but in elite i mean you you don't always just go to the next ship and then you're just in that ship i have several that i fly for different purposes and the ones that i fly routinely i totally decorate them although while we're talking about paint jobs i want to complain that the cobra mark 4 only has like two paint jobs available in the store yeah Get on what is with that i need options it's yeah. a special ship that we get for buying uh some package i think but then there's no customization for it and the cobra mark 3 stuff won't work on the mark 4 the paint jobs i think that's a little ridiculous the paint job that you buy for a cobra that fits on a mark 3 should fit on a mark 4 the ships are almost identical but enough ranting. There are things to talk about. No rant away. I don't think there's all that much to talk about, actually. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> of course, moving, talking about the aliens, um, we made a, I made a little joke about it uh, earlier, but what do you guys think is going to happen with the release of 2.3 next week? The only thing we've heard is a little bit of teaser that something is happening with the aliens, and the Maya system is still locked off in beta, I believe. Um, I haven't been down there because I've been exploring, but uh, I think that's still locked up or permit locked. So do you think we're going to have an invasion or just some small alien event coming? Well, I, I hope it's not. An, uh, honestly, the last thing I want to have introduced into a game like this is a overpowered NPC uh, enemy. You know, it's, it's like enough already. I mean, we already got enough activity and stuff. I, I don't need to be going to, to battle and on, you know, the Thargoids, who obviously are fairly techni- more technological than us, and uh, just we just don't need it in the game. The thing that intrigues me is they mentioned it could make a difference to, or upcoming events could make a difference to gameplay for the way a lot of people play with the alien events upcoming. I wonder if they're expecting explorers to have to carry weapons and armor to deal with alien encounters in deep space now. Because a lot of people go out into deep space with no shields, no weapons. I've done it. And then if you're, you know, interdicted by an alien out there and you have nothing, you're going to be in a lot of trouble. Well, all we've seen from the Thargoid so far is, you know, overpowering technology and shutting you down and things like that. What will the Thargoids actually be like to fight? Will they be more in-game boss-like fights? Or will they or they will they vary the gamut and have um, Thargoids for each skill level? <laughs> Yeah, that's a good question. I have a feeling it'll be more on the raid side, where you really have to go seek them out with a with a bunch of friends, right? You have to get a wing together. It it would be smart for Elite, given that they have a wide variety of players who want to do different things in the game. It would make sense for them to go, okay, so we've got a galaxy that's only single digit percent explored so they could just go okay this section of it is interdicted which makes up like 10 percent of the galaxy if you're in the other 90 you don't have to worry that is very likely what's going to happen they have right entire areas that are permit locked that some of them are even larger than human inhabited uh, area of space so they're obviously marked off for some upcoming thing and if those are going to be areas that are occupied by alien civilizations, I would assume in and around them you would have to worry. But probably way out at like Beagle Point where explorers are really far out there, you probably would still be safe, I'd hope. 
What I really don't want to have happen is any implementation that is like the original implementation of the Thargoids, where you would be interdicted in hyperspace, and then you would be in a, a no-win scenario where you would definitely be destroyed and have to start over. That's the way the Thargoids originally showed up in the original Elite. That wouldn't go over well. It wouldn't go over well, but it's something I could see Frontier doing because it would give them a lot of people saying there's this overwhelming alien force and then they could have missions where you have to rank up with engineers to get shields that can withstand them or weapons that can hurt them. But until you've ranked up like that, you would be in no-win situations. So I think as much as it sounds like a terrible idea, it's still a possibility based on the way things have gone in Elite in the past um, with the Thargoids. Do you think I'm barking up the wrong tree there? I just don't think from a business perspective it would be something that they'd pursue. Except that they did it before. They did it in the first Elite, and I think uh, in, in the second one um, that they had the Thargoids in, there was one that they didn't have Thargoids those weren't on. Oh, those weren't online games, right? They didn't they have weren't right. online games, and I don't think you paid insurance when you were destroyed in the first one, so it's right. possible so to... That's- yeah, it's it's an entirely different experience in that case. Like, I would liken it more to what happened in the X series. Like, there was one of the games, I don't remember if it was two or three, but anyway, they had an alien invasion as part of the major plot line in the game. And the aliens showed up and completely wrecked a system that most players would have been using as a regular waypoint to build their initial fortune. But if you didn't want to go through the main storyline, and if you didn't want to get into conflict with them, because they were really difficult to fight unless you specifically uh, modulated your ship in order to do it, you could very easily completely avoid them for whatever you were doing. Um, like everybody knew where they were I say everybody, it was still a single player game, but their location was known, their location was obvious they would occasionally show up in other areas of the galaxy that you were playing in, but the alien invasion was essentially avoidable if you didn't want to deal with it, so I think given how like MMOs that have made earth shattering changes that are unavoidable in game usually haven't fared well in the long term with them i think it's more likely that they're going to make it if not 100 percent optional then at least easily avoidable this week's elite dangerous community question what do you think is going to happen when the thargoids show up let us know our list of stylish and free contact info is coming up Now it's time for news we didn't use. Inove has dropped a loose release date of summer fall of 2018 for the final release of Infinity Battlescape. The day this show comes out, Eve Valkyrie is releasing its fifth map update, Solitude. This map sees players battling it out on a remote planet as they weave their way through tight-knit passageways. Star Citizen is releasing 2.6.3 as of the recording of this show. Only bug fixes and performance improvements in this one, boys and girls. One other little piece of news I'd like to just kind of throw out there for a talk later. So I I have seen a couple of uh, people are putting together a fan-run citizen con in the U.S. that will happen at the same time as the citizen con in Germany. The whole thing is where is that? It will be in Austin, Texas, where I live. Oh, cool. Uh, yeah, it's being put on by a, a bunch of people from the Bar Citizen and some streamers and stuff like that. They don't really have any details to put out yet, but they're kind of um, just throwing it out there so people don't uh, uh, make other plans on that date when they're not going to Germany. And anybody that's going to it can stay at Kinchetto's house, right? Yeah. My, you know, my wife might object to that, but uh, we'll see about that anyway. <laughs> But, uh, yeah, no details, but just throwing that out there, and, and um, I'll probably be there, as well as uh, some other people, and I believe there might be might be some people from SIG, too. 
that are, are tentatively on there, people that aren't going out to Germany. We'll, we'll stop on by. Good to know. Now that we're all cut up with the latest news, let's tune in the feedback loop and let you join in on the conversation. Okay, buddy, what's on your mind? We're all friendly! So let's just be friendly! Some say he once lost a canoe on a beach in the northeast, and he has no understanding of clouds. He also has no understanding of how jokes work. But all we know is he's called the Shiv, and he helped put together this week's feedback. Our beloved audio engineer, Mikey, writes in and says, While the guard frequency guys are around to rescue you in-game, it is possible for all listeners of the show to save a life in the real world. Please consider registering as an organ and tissue donor. Visit www.donatelife.net for more information. Yeah, and Mikey shared some some uh, unfortunate news from a close friend of his that could have been affected by this. So we do encourage all Guard Frequency listeners to um, please put that organ donor on your license, please. Says right on my license, organ donor. Recap of last week's community questions. Will you miss the Star Citizen crowdfunding update figures now that they're gone? Our Star Citizen community question was, in Around the Verse, they went into a little more technical details on the changes of the physic grids than the high-level overview that they normally give. We want to know, what's your opinion on this? Should they be giving us the nitty-gritty whenever possible, or should they just give us the TLDR version? The Elite Dangerous community question, it's generated a bit of controversy out in the Verse, but we want to know what you think of the changes to the multi-crew payouts. And with regards to Infinity Battlescape, what are your thoughts on 300 player spaceship battles? Are you looking forward to being in the middle of a conflict that large, or are you the sort of pilot that prefers smaller skirmishes? Have you ever participated in one of EVE's famed thousand player fleet battles? If so, we'd love to hear your experience. Our debate question from last week, is manned turret gameplay a beneficial alternate way to participate in space sims that just need some development to get over current hurdles, or will it always be a little used feature marred by limitations or immersion breaking abstractions? Amontillado writes in and says, I don't miss the crowdfunding update. The folks at CIG should give us the nitty gritty details and leave the T. LDR version for podcasts and light guard frequency to disseminate. Man turrets sound like a great idea in theory. I haven't seen them implemented well in video games as of yet. Hopefully they're very clever people building these games can figure out a way to change that. Mandrius3 writes in and says, I'll miss the Star Citizen crowdfunding update. I'd prefer you keep it, but if you don't, well, I forgive you. Very, very gracious of you. Bree Serena writes in and says, For Community Question 1, Honestly, the crowdfunding update were nice, but since reaching 100 million, I have really stopped caring. Anytime I need to update my financial spreadsheet that I keep, I look on the Star Citizen website. Winky face. Star Citizen Community Question. As a community, I think the more detailed information that SIG gives us, the less confusion there will be, even with the technically declined because of the more technical people within can distill it in layman's terms. For me, though, I'm a detail-driven person. So the more SIG goes into detail about a particular tech or methodology, the happier I'll be. Doesn't hurt that I'm interested in learning game development either. The elite community question, don't play enough elite to care about multi-crew payouts too many other games to play before I hop back into Elite. The Infinity Battlescape question, I have never participated in a huge multiplayer battle, but since I'm looking forward to it in either Dual Universe, Infinity Battlescape, or Star Citizen, the only thing I can really comment on is that I would need some decent communication hierarchy to, to facilitate a battle like that. Community question two, I think a lot of people will get a rude awakening about man turrets once all the kinks are ironed out in Star Citizen. I never truly understood the viability of having man turret on a fighter because a fighter is meant to be agile. In my honest opinion, man turrets need to be a stable platform to be effective. Unless the turret operator is firing at a moment of opportunity, targets before the pilot jukes and dies. On bigger ships, I think both pilot and gunners need to be in a constant communication, and pilot will have to learn to fly relatively stable and soak up damage to give their gunners time to acquire and shoot their targets. Uh, B-52 style. Krell says, 
Two feedbacks, a dumb joke, and a show format comment, non-feedback. Trying to make it easy for you, perhaps I need to start adding a table of contents section. I have seen the rest of this feedback and it might be helpful. Table of contents section. <laughs> um, 300 plus ship battles. This is in response to Infinity Battlescape. The ability to have a battle that large also means the environment will feel alive. Think about what that means around a busy spaceport. 300 ships loading and unloading cargo, patrolling, fueling, repairing, etc. all in the same instance. Some of those will be other players, many of them will be NPCs, but none of them will be non-interactive background. You'll be able to engage any of them in one way or another, and that's pretty awesome when you think about it. Turrets. To add to my hurricane feedback a couple of weeks ago and to expand on what Tony said, turrets are workable if your game is designed around big ship versus little ship combat. Think about World War II style naval combat where you have a distinct break between ships and planes. You can break it down into four categories. One, big versus big, slow moving, heavy armored targets, attack with heavy guns, in Star Citizen rail guns perhaps, or torpedoes. Defense is less about avoidance and more about armor and shields. Two, small versus small, quick moving, lightly relatively armored targets, attack with the equivalent of machine guns or light missiles. Defense is mostly about not getting hit. Three, small versus big, Torpedoes versus heavy armor. You don't get any more iconic Star Wars style science fantasy battle than that. I have to agree. Number four is big versus small. This is where turrets get interesting. When your big ship is big enough, it becomes a stable platform, which, as Tony rightly points out, is pretty much required to make turrets workable. Add zero order aiming, and you have something that resembles space fantasy fights like in Battlestar Galactica, and something I think would probably be a lot of fun to play, especially if you add additional functionality to the turret gunner position. For the most part, I think turrets on small ships are a waste of space. I think it will be incredibly difficult to make turrets on the Constellation and anything smaller, Cutlass, Freelancer, etc. viable. Starfarer turret gunner? Heck yeah. Hurricane turret gunner? Good luck with that. Also, I thought you should be warned that reverbating leads to growing shag carpeting on your palms. <laughs> A non... <laughs> Ken from Chicago says, Honestly, my eyes, ears... Glazed over one star says and reached about a million dollars. I think he means more than that. I think he means a hundred million <laughs> in funding. I hadn't realized that it, it's over a hundred and forty-five million. Maybe just hashtag star says and reaching big funding amounts: one hundred and fifty million, two hundred million, two hundred and fifty million, etc. Crude and remote turrets can work. Turrets are remote controlled until damage requires direct control. Also. RC ones can be jammed unlike crude ones. In other words, it adds to gameplay. Crude turrets equal one ship shoots multiple targets faster. All right, guys, we read this crap on there. You can just type full sentences, please. <laughs> but thanks for the feedback. It's all appreciated. Yeah, I love your feedback. You all, you have I love feedback. your feedback, but type this crap in full sentences. <laughs> <laughs> Just, just some semblance of English, you know. The math equations, that saves you, what, like five seconds? Remote-controlled ones shoot the same target as pilot or pilot has to reprogram targets for them. These are all good points. I don't see any math equations in the next feedback. I'm going to try to get through it without stumbling here. There is a decimal point in a number. So I will do my be best. This is from Error Detected. It's understandable. The fundraising successes are interesting data, but I'd rather keep track of tangible progress against big picture development goals, particularly 3.0 and Squadron 42. I'm more interested in the big picture view right now. Physics grid details are interesting, but too often it feels like ATV zooms in very closely to a feature or asset without giving us enough big picture context to understand where the projects stand. I'd prefer recurring monthly features like the Squadron 42 progress report and the state of 3.0 over constant deep dives into particular tech. As it stands, nobody has a clue about the biggest things everybody awaits, and that remains a frustration for some of us. Being in on the beta, I'm of mixed opinion on this, cautiously hopeful. I can see why Frontier wants to increase player engagement, yet also respect the frustrations many have with the immersion-breaking nature of telepresence or what they perceive as the skewed reward system for multi-crew. 
CIG and Frontier are in similar boats sometimes when it comes to taking a widely desired but general promise, the joys of multi-crew gaming in this case, and having to deliver a specific solution. Perceived winners and losers emerge, opportunities for gaming the mechanic, potentially for nefarious purposes, becomes clear. And what began as a new hope quickly becomes a swirling vortex of whining and accusations. Such is the nature of open development, I guess. We'll see after the update goes live how and what to do to the extent that such dramatic change impacts the player experience and the micro game. Chuck007 says, I actually like the nitty gritty from CIG, but feel we are really only getting this information because they're running out of stuff they are willing or wanting to show and tell. Man turrets are going to become important once the hiring of crews becomes a reality. This will quickly become a ship mod, like bigger guns, stronger shields, and an accurate turret gun. Large space battles, yes. The added benefit people do not realize is that with Amazon Lumberyard, you'll be unknowingly fighting with other players that are very local internet-wise. He then amended his feedback a short while later and said, Ha, huh, sorry, just realized the 300 ship battles were with Infinity Battlescape. Still yes, but would have to have a means of keeping track of your wingmen. Easily lost in the dogfight. In general feedback, Sean Newboy writes in and says, Loved the show, everyone. Auto Rotator says, TIL, things I learned will be using Mode C transponders. Not sure what that uh, applies to. So a little bit on what Air Detected said, something that he, he brought up made me think about how people might be viewing the elite multi-crew uh, benefits as skewing away from people that are doing single-player combat. And I'm wondering if people are actually complaining about this on the ED forums, or is this kind of a speculation, or is this just something weird that I'm reading into his comments? What do you mean? Meaning I mean, that, I haven't heard anything like that. The me- meaning that if, you know, you're getting basically a combined multiple uh, under the old system for the bounties and rewards and stuff, then it doesn't make a lot of sense to play the game as solo and you should group up and so there's social ple- pressure to group up more often, right? And I know some people are have that same comment about Star Citizen in some cases where you know, the bigger ships require multiple people to fly or, you know, will not be very effective with only flying with NPCs or however you want to term it. And so there are some diehard fans on the forums that say, I really want to be able to fly my Idris or my Javelin just myself, you know, and I find it completely unfair that you're making me require crew in order to fly this. So if, again, if the ED benefits are definitely skewing that way for them trying to get people to play together more often, I didn't it made, it made it sound like people would be complaining about it from a solo, solo player perspective. I haven't heard any complaints like that. Um, only thing I'm hearing is people are upset over the rewards and the way that they're being split based on ranks now. But I haven't heard anything about uh, you know the players not wanting it. Players want to group up and play together. And since a lot of elite players are playing in Mobius or playing in not solo but private group, you're going to have a lot of multiplayer people that aren't doing PvP. PvPers may be upset about multi-crew, but that, you know, that's a different form of gameplay altogether than what I do usually. Why would PvPers be upset about multi-crew? I don't know, because they're going to be getting, uh, you know, a whole new, like, they'll, they'll be fighting people that have crew members and that could make it more difficult for them, or they could find that the new meta in that game is to have three crew members, which they may not have, um, so it could change the way they're fighting or playing or, or alter their build. Honestly, I don't see the point in going into open anymore without multi-crew, as dangerous it is, as it is in there with the PvP. That's a good point. And a reminder of this week's community questions. Star Citizen, are you using the new Spectrum site? Is the shutdown of the old forums going to cause you separation anxiety? We here at Guard Frequency are concerned and will always be willing to help you. So send us your thoughts. Our Elite Dangerous community question. Are you going to be ponying up some cash for a new look now that the prices have dropped? What do you think is going to happen when Thargoids show up? Drop us an email, a tweet, or comment on our show's post, which you will find on our website and over on our Facebook page. So, how was the show? Were our animations smooth? Or did we continually depose? Either way, let us know. Here's how you can get in touch with us. 
why not leave us a comment on this show's post over at GuardFrequency.com. Or hit us up on Twitter at GuardFreak and leave a comment and like us on Facebook at Facebook.com forward slash GuardFreak. You can also use the contact form on our website, and all the details for all the ways you can get in touch with us can be found in the show notes. Your feedback is an important part of what we do, so take a minute and tell us what's on your mind. And that brings us to the end of episode 163 of Guard Frequency. We'll be back with episode 164 on April 14th, so be sure to keep an eye out for our shows over at GuardFrequency.com. But that's not all. You can also subscribe to our shows over at feeds.guardfrequency.com or by searching for us on iTunes. Do you like what we do? Want to help us make the best damn space sim podcast ever? Drop us an email to squawk at guardfrequency.com. And you can also support the show by visiting our website, clicking on that big Patreon logo and becoming a regular subscriber. For just $1.25 a week, you'll get access to the raw recordings of our live shows, some Guard Frequency goodies, and an invitation to join our private Elite Dangerous Flight Group. We want to thank all of our Patreons who support us with their subscriptions week on week and hope you'll consider making a regular contribution. Because the more support we get, the better show we can make. Are you looking for a friendly wingman or two? We are active in most space sims and would love to have you come join us. Why don't you check our website out and look under the call sign section for details on how you can fly with us. And don't forget about our sister production, Priority One. They cover all things Star Trek, from the TV series to the MMO, the novels, the movies, and everything in between. Oh my god. Be sure and check them out over at PriorityOnePodcast.com. We'd like to thank the entire team at Guard Frequency and the Priority One Network. Thanks to our community manager, Justin Chivalry Beam Lowmaster, our artists, Ben Sanders and Simon Charlton Edwards, our staff writer, Jace Pentad, and of course, our audio engineer, Mikey. Thanks to our syndication partner, The Bass, and special thanks to Ronald Jenkins for his permission to use his music in our show. Visit RonaldJenkins.com for more of his work. But above all, we especially want to thank you folks for tuning in. If no one's listening out there, the deep black gets pretty lonely. Reduce thrust. Contact 330, Carol 15. Squawk 7700. Stay on the curve. The the uh, the whole th- uh, where was I going with this? Um, the moon? Yeah, I know I was going to the to the moon, Alice to the moon. Uh, nobody knows uh, that. So while he's looking that up, the uh, gold shirt and fuchsia pants—that's going to be the new official guard frequency uniform, right? Hell no! I wouldn't be caught dead <laughs> in that. <laughs> Fine, full fuchsia pants and top for you, leisure suit, Jeff. Fuchsia leisure suit. Leisure suit. No, no leisure suit. Larry's here. <laughs> Char- chartreuse is also an option. It's all. It's cool. They're they're splitting that up though, uh, so that you can break it up. That's missing from the elite uh, customization system. I'm looking forward to it well, being well, better in Star Citizen. Hold on, that's that's actual commentary. We have and it's good radio. Time. Sorry. <laughs> so, well, <laughs> trying to fill the hey, air. Take take it from the CEO, which is me. There will be no on duty. Chartreuse, fuchsia, or gold, anything. I gotta go change this speedo then. I guess I can't really say that if I can't cite it, so that's fine. We'll just, uh. I heard it was the 14th too, but I heard it from you just now, so I don't know if that's a great source. (laughs) Recap of last week's community questions Will you miss the Star Citizen crowdfunding update figures now that they're gone? No, this is not an April Fuse. Yeah. Actually, I'm not even going to read that part. Next. And the debate question from last week. Is man turret gameplay a beneficial alternate way to... Yeah, that wasn't right. Mandrius3 writes in and says, I'll miss the crowd citizen. Crowd citizen. (sighs) Starfarer turret gun? Starfarer turret? Okay, we're done now. (laughs) Hey, before we go, does anybody know how much money Star Citizen made last week? I have no idea. Oh man, <laughs> Jesus Christ! You know, there's a if you have Windows 10, there is a there is an app you can get. It's called R- RSI Hub or Star Citizen Center, and it'll tell you. So, 
Current numbers for this week are 146,159,960. Funds raised. Star Citizens are 1,776,129. And the UEE fleet was 1,243,914. So, did I cure your curiosity? Yes, thank you. But what is that in Quadloos? Oh, shut up. <laughs> they are making a lot of money. They're making the, the technical term is bukus, bukus of money. Now, that is interesting about the app, though. I didn't know they had that uh, app for the update. That's cool. Yeah, it, actually, the Star Citizen Center is awesome. I, it, it, I started when they first developed it, and it's really nice. It's got com links, developer activity, patch notes, ship specs, ship upgrades, star map, and all kinds of other interesting things. That should be in the yeah. show. Actually, we should have probably mentioned that you can get all that from the website and the app when we mentioned we were taking the updates out. Whoops. Missed opportunities. You know, we never actually mentioned the guardfrequency.com slash madlibs. Like, we took it out of a damn show and then didn't I think do it's it being developed back. still, right? No, it was a, like a linen's <laughs> afternoon project. And that oh, was I it, thought I it was going to make it prettier. Well, for all you Patreon listeners that are still listening to this recording... Go to guardfrequency.com slash madlibs for a special surprise just for you. I got to go change this speedo then.